So hi, um, my name is, thank you for, for, for being here and thank you, Melissa, for organizing um, the events for Chemistry Week. Um, really excited. I, um, my name is Lily. For those of you who do not know me, I, um, I have been with Purdue for, I believe now, 14 years. I have, hi, Jenny. I have, um, yeah, I started, this is my side gig. I am, uh, I am a, thank you for sharing that, Melissa. I am a chemist by education. I am a forensic scientist by trade, and I teach as my hobby because I like it. Um, and I teach um, usually. I'm a teacher, the uh, an adjunct instructor at the in science department, um, and I mostly teach um, anatomy, and biology, and all the non-chemistry courses. Actually, is what I enjoy teaching the most. <laughs> I I understand chemistry. I teach it if I have to, but I it's not my preference. It's it's hard for me to explain chemistry. But anyways, uh, enough about me. That uh, today I am going to be talking a little bit about vaccines, in particular the mRNA vaccine and how it works. Um, given that the flu season recently started and, new, and a new COVID booster was recently released to try to thwart the most recent COVID uptick, um, we thought it'd be timely to talk a little bit about vaccines and um, especially about how the mRNA vaccine works and how it's different from, from the other more common ones. So to understand why we're even talking about vaccines, during chemistry week, right? Kind of seems a little odd um, because vaccines relate more to, to disease and the immune response of the body. Um, so I, to get us there, I, I want to, to review the relationship between chemistry and biology really quickly. Um, biology, as you probably know, studies living organisms, right? And chemistry studies elements and their compositions and their interactions um, and the structures and reactions with other elements. But because all living things have mass and occupy space, um, it means we're all made up of matter. So, which in turn means that biology couldn't be without chemistry. So to make it a bit more visual, to offer a little bit more context, um, I've included a couple of tangible, so to speak, examples um, on how these two disciplines interact or intersect. So if you think of nutrition and digestion, you probably think of the biology, right? But in uh, within nutrition, you have your macronutrients, your micronutrients, your acids, your bases, your vitamins, all of that are chemicals. You have genetics. You think about genetics as a discipline in biology, but DNA and RNA, which are the foundation for genetics, are chemical molecules. Um, think about homeostasis and the balance that the body has to achieve to work properly. Um, but homeostasis requires proper gas exchange, hormonal balance, and pH uh, control, and all of those are chemical um, concepts. So there is a lot of chemistry in biology. And so in, 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 and there's a lot of chemistry in vaccines in particular. So hopefully that gets you, gives you an idea of why we're talking about um, vaccines during chemistry week. I want to start really quickly um, to give giving you an overview of how immunity works. And I'm going to keep this very simple. I can talk for an hour on immunity, but we don't have that much time to talk about um, to, to fit it all in, 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 in one hour. So very, very generally speaking, um, immunity, this is the way immunity works. You have a pathogen, the pathogen attaches to the cell and injects, pathogen attaches to one of your cells and injects its genetic material, which could be either DNA or RNA, depending on what the um, pathogen is. And because genetic material contains the, the blue the blueprint or the um, instructions to make more, to divide, to replicate, to make more of the same cells, it essentially hijacks our cells and, tell them, and tells them to make more of that particular pathogen, which in turn then creates more pathogens, right? It creates this like chain reaction and you just keep producing more pathogens. Um, thankfully, our bodies are amazing and they were well designed and they contain a line of defense of our immune system. So the immune system is, is, um, is in place to identify any unknown molecules and serve as our first line of defense. So think about an alarm to our house. You know, it might alert us that there's a burglar. That's our first line of defense. Or actually the door to the house might be the first line of defense. 
Um, but this alert um, allows us to prepare our defense. And although sometimes it might take a little while, it, it helps us create and build our defense um, against that pathogen. And we start generating what we call antibodies. Now the antibodies serve two functions. The first one is they attach to the pathogen's uh, cells and in doing so, they change their appearance. And if you change the appearance, then it prevents them from attaching to our cells. And the second function is that they, ser they serve as a marking or a tag to alert other cells in our immune system to destroy them. It's like they put a little flag, it's like make it obvious. It's like this guy doesn't belong here. Let's go in and get rid of them. Um, but because it takes our, our bodies a little while to be able to mount a defense towards the new intruder, we've developed this thing called vaccine, um, which essentially shows our bodies what those intruders look like so that we are better prepared to attack them without delay. Because like I said, we have an immune system, but it doesn't immediately attack. It, it you know, When you're presented with something new, you sometimes get startled. You need to know, you need to be prepared. You don't have your tools to defend yourself. The vaccines provide those tools in advance as a preemptive measure to prepare you for what potentially uh, could come. So a vaccine, the vaccines. Vaccines are a mixture of ingredients because I don't have a better term to describe them. It's just a concoction. Um, most of these um, ingredients that we find in vaccines occur naturally, whether it's in the environment, sometimes in food, sometimes even within our bodies. Um, and vaccines are created with the purpose, again, of protecting us from harf, from harf, wow, harmful diseases um, should, we come, should we come in contact with them. So again, they're a pre preemptive measure. They're designed to make our immune system more aware of the threats out there and therefore better equipped to fight them. Um, typically, we can break down the ingredients in vaccines into four different categories. Um, the first one is the antigen, which is usually, a, I, I like to call it a wannabe of, of whatever pathogen it is, right? It's something that's similar to the pathogen, but not the pathogen itself. Or sometimes it's a pathogen itself, but it's either killed or attenuated. So it, it's, a, it's a similar version of the actual bad guy that wants to enter our body. Um, they can take the form of um, fungi, bacteria, it could be parasites, viruses, chemicals, pollen, you name it. Um, they're all antigens, they're all foreign entities that could uh, cause some sort of reaction to our body. Um, there are also stabilizers in vaccines. Stabilizers are there to protect the main ingredients of the vaccine, meaning the, the antigen. Um, during the manufacturing process, the storage and the transport of that vaccine. An example of a, sta of a stabili stabilizer is um, gelatin, which is, is, is known to, to sometimes cause allergic reactions to, in certain individuals when you're we're getting that vaccine. We also have adjuvants. I don't ever know if I'm saying that we're right. Is it adjuvants or adjuvants? Whichever. Um, they're not present in all vaccines. Um, they're there to add, uh, to enhance the immune system or the immune response to a particular antigen. Um, so it, it, it's there to kind of help boost the immunity to that particular act, um, antigen. See, the immune system has a series of cells. One of them is known as the T cell. And the T cell is responsible for generating antibodies or these molecules that fight um, the intruder, right? Um, so what these adjuvants do is they help recruit these cells, and in doing so, they boost the effectiveness of the vaccines, particularly the ones that are made of the of the of the actual um, pathogen in, in in either a killed or in or a subdued form. And uh, on the slide, there's a list of the various adjuvants that are used in, in vaccines in the United States. If you're interested. Um, Sometimes these components or these, these chemicals lead to side effects like, like redness in the area of the um, injection for the vaccine. And then finally, there's preservatives, which you've probably heard about preservatives before, right? Just like in foods, they're there to prevent or delay the growth of fungi or bacterial. 
Um, these, just like the adjuvants, are not necessarily present in all vaccines. And these preservatives are usually some type of alcohol, which can also be found in, in a lot of um, cosmetic products. All right. So there are different types of vaccines. Uh, and, and the type of vaccine that's manufactured for a particular pathogen, it, it's determined. There's a lot of things that go into play here, but generally speaking, um, it, it's based on uh, the individual's need to be vaccinated and the, the best approach that's available in terms of technology uh, to, to create that particular vaccine. Uh, there are attenuated vaccines. These are live vaccines, so they actually contain the virus or the pathogen. They, but they're but they're in a subdued form, right? It's not the full blown pathogen. Um, it's it's a very attenuated form of the pathogen. And these, because it's the virus itself or the or the pathogen itself, they usually provide a long and a, and a strong immune response. An example of an attenuated uh, vaccine is the MMR. You guys have probably had that before. I think it's mandated for school and stuff like that. So that's the measles, mumps, and um, this is our stand for rubella. And the chicken pox and smallpox vaccines are also examples of attenuated or, or live vaccines. We also have inactivated vaccines. You can probably now assume they don't provide the same lasting effects as the life, as the life vaccines. Um, which means that usually we require boosters for that one. And we're going to talk about boosters a little bit uh, later. Examples of inactivated vaccines are the flu vaccines, which we're pretty familiar with. Um, we're offering it right now. And um, rabies is also uh, an inactivated vaccine. Uh, subunit vaccines are, we don't hear much about these, but subunit vaccines, actually there is a, COVID vaccine that is a subunit vaccine. It's not as effective as the mRNA vaccines, but it is also available. Um, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, it's it's a subunit vaccine. Or no, the Novavax vaccine is a subunit vaccine. Um, so what these do is they use a portion of the pathogen. Yeah, it's, it's the Novavax. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. I'm like, what, what am I talking about? Um, so subunit vaccines, what they do is they, it, it's essentially what the name says, you take a subunit, a portion of that pathogen in, in question, and it could be it could be the protein, it could be an outer shell component, something, something of that um, pathogen, and you just inject it in your body. Uh, so you're not putting the entire thing inside, you're just providing some portion of it, but some portion, sufficient, a sufficient portion that the body can identify, our bodies can identify something um, for it and, and, and develop immunity for it. So they do offer a strong immune response and they um, they can be used in, in um, immunocompromised patients because the actual pathogen is not being injected, which is one of the one of the good things about these um, newer vaccines is that you're not actually giving the pathogen to the individual, which makes it a little bit safer because you're not you're not likely to get all of these side effects. You're going to get some side effects, and I'm going to talk about that also um, later, but you're not going to get all of the full-blown side effects that you would if you were being injected with the actual pathogen. Um, shingles, hepatitis B, um, I think HPV, those are subunit vaccines. And, and like I mentioned, the Novavax um, is also a subunit. The Novavax, which targets COVID-19, um, is also a, a subunit vaccine. Toxoid vaccines um, use toxins that are produced by the pathogen, and therefore our bodies target the toxins rather than the pathogen itself when we're inject uh, when we're exposed to it. Uh, tet tetanus is is uh, an example of a um, toxoid vaccine. There's also a viral vector vaccines which use a different virus that is um, non harmful, uh, so it uses a different virus as the messenger to deliver the pathogen in question. And there's a lot of other, there's several other types of vaccines in the works. Now, the newest one is, um, and, and, and one that was developed in a seemingly short time frame, right, was the mRNA vaccines. I say seemingly in quotation marks, because that's not really true. Um, and this is the main character of this talk, so I'm going to talk about it a little bit in a little bit more detail. 
Um, and I'm going to take you all the way back again. Biology and chemistry kind of interact constantly. So um, just, just briefly, uh, to understand how an mRNA vaccine works, we need to understand what mRNA is. So just as a refresher, if you remember back when the day when we were in school and um, <laughs> um, you learned biology or molecular biology, the central dogma of molecular biology explained how uh, the information flows inside a cell. It tells us how DNA, which is our instruction manual, and the instru instruction manual for anything or every in everything in our in our body, um, directs RNA to make proteins, which are essentially the work the workhorses of the cell. So DNA replicates itself, which means it makes a bunch of copies of itself, and this happens all the time that cells die uh, and divide to form new ones. Um, and then the information contained in the DNA is transcribed into messenger RNA. And we can certainly equate this to transcribing notes, for example. I know when I take notes really fast, I then need to sit down and, and calmly transcribe them to make them more legible so that I can then read them and understand them. If I just let it go, I will go back and not know what in the world I wrote. So it's kind of what happens here. Once the DNA is transcribed into a more readable language, that message is then used to create a protein that will carry out some ultimate specific function. The mRNA, messenger RNA, serves as that message intermediary that helps code for particular proteins. So what does this have to do with vaccines? Why am I talking about this? Here we go. You likely recall about three years ago, right? Our lives changed because of the emergence of the SARS-CoV um, virus. And because of the gravity of the situation, we needed a plan to help eradicate or at least attenuate this, this pandemic thing. So mRNA, and this is why I said, quote unquote, it's new um, earlier, mRNA research have been done actually for years. I want to say almost a decade. Um, we didn't have one, but there was a lot of research already done um, in mRNA vaccines and the potential of mRNA vaccines, which is why we were able to develop these really, really quickly. Seems like a good. It seemed like a good option for our plan of attack for COVID because it could be developed fast because we already had a lot, a lot of knowledge. It could be developed in, in a kind of I I would inexpensive. I'm not sure that it's inexpensive, but it's less expensive than the others, right? In a, in a by comparison, a relatively inexpensive way, and because it does not inject you with the actual pathogen, it would be safe to administer even to um, immunocompromised individuals. This is currently the only um, mRNA, so the COVID-19 is the only mRNA vaccine approved right now, but there are other uses um, being researched. Um, I believe the flu influenza is one of them, and there's something else, maybe I want to say, Shingles, maybe I don't recall, but there's something else. There's a, there's a few other things that are being um, researched uh, for the development of mRNA vaccines. So how do they work? All right, the SARS-CoV virus has it's a very distinctive virus. Um, it's called Corona because it has a Corona. We call it coronavirus because it has Corona around it. Um, the Corona is these these spikes, um, and you can see in that electron um, microscope picture that I stole from NIH, um, you, you can see the little spikes on the outer shell. These spikes are made up of protein, and that is what this virus uses to attach itself to our cells. So if we can somehow, this was the idea, if we can somehow be, pre, I mean, um, if we can somehow uh, mimic or identify these uh, spike proteins, and, and show them to our immune system, then we could be prepared to, to fight the infection. And that is exactly what the mRNA vaccine does. It provides the body with the instructions to make that spike protein that is present in the coronavirus. The body then, our cells, will take that information, will take that messenger RNA and express it. It will make the protein, express that protein, so essentially, we're creating the spike protein ourselves. And our body will recognize this as a strange creature 
and will st it, it will stimulate an immune response. So the spike itself is a foreign body, but on its own, it's harmless, right? So the production by our cells triggers the generation of antibodies so that we can fight those spikes. And in fighting those spikes, we're fighting, we would eventually we'll fight the entire virus, right? Because it's, it comes as a whole. Um, and in fact, our body actually, um, our immune system eventually, or it ends up destroying all the generated spikes, the virus itself, if it's attacking us, or the mRNA uh, that directed the formation of that protein. So we're injecting ourselves, or we're, I mean, we're getting that vaccine and we're injecting the mRNA virus in our, in our bodies. Once we create that spike protein, we destroyed the, our immune system, destroyed the, the spike protein as well as that mRNA that was initially injected in our body. Make sense? I hope so. Um, what's cool about this is that our immune system not only dispatches uh, defenders, the so-called antibodies and, and T cells, which train the immune system for potential future attacks. But we also have these cells in our in our immune system known as the B cells. And they are they're also known as memory cells. And what they do is they remember what these spikes look like so that they can easily be identified if they were to come back. It's like you dare come back. I've seen you before. So if you come back, I know. I know how you look, what you look like, and I know you don't belong here, so I'm going to be ready. Um, the memory of these cells lasts anywhere from months to years, and for as long as the memory remains, we should be able to fight back um, immediately by producing antibodies and therefore preventing the sickness that's associated with the pathogen. Um, and again, it's important to note or to point out that because we're not delivering the actual virus, there is no risk of causing the actual disease. Uh, in the individual getting vaccinated. Now, I want to make the distinction. The vaccine will not give you COVID. There is no, there's no way the vaccine can give you COVID. You're not putting COVID in your body. But that does not mean you cannot get infected with COVID after having been vaccinated. Um, th th those are two completely different things. And, and there's a misconception that's like, well, why would I get vaccinated? I, or I got vaccinated and I still got COVID. I can assure you got vaccinated even... The vaccine does not prevent you from getting COVID, but it does help with the response, which means you will probably not experience the symptoms to the same degree that a person that has not gotten the vaccine will. And I hope that makes sense. So that's something that everyone struggles with. Like I have friends that are like, well, what's the point of getting vaccinated? I still get it. Well, you might not get it because you might just having a, enough of us uh, an immune response that to fight it completely and it never um, affects you. But if it actually infects you and it gets through, you still have the tools to fight it. And even if you don't win every single battle in that war, you have you will win some versus if you're not vaccinated, you're likely you're likely just losing the war and, and just succumbing to the um, to the uh, symptoms of COVID-19 which could, depending on who the person is, unfortunately could lead to death if they're immunocompromised or have other um, underlying uh, conditions. So we currently have two mRNA vaccines approved for use in the United States. We have, actually, we have three now recently. Um, I should have fixed that. But we have, well, not, actually, we have two mRNA vaccines. We have three, four COVID vaccines, but three, uh, two mRNA vaccines. We have Moderna, which is also known as spike vax, um, fitting, right? This is the spikes that we're targeting, spike vaccine. And then we have the uh, Pfizer BioNTech vaccine, which is also known as the uh, Comirnaty. And they're basically the exact same thing. Um, the only differences are the preservatives and stabilizers within them. Um, and, and like I mentioned before, these are the things that control, I'm sorry, the pH of the vaccine and prevent the bacterial and or fungal growth, not prevent or prevent or or delay, I guess, the growth of bacterial or, or fungi. Um, the effectiveness of the vaccines is essentially the same um, after two doses, and I'll talk a little bit more in a minute about that. Um, we do need the two doses to get that effectiveness. Uh, if we get only one dose, you will not you will not reach that level of of. Um, defense, I guess. 
And then we have, of course, the, the COVID, uh, the Johnson & Johnson COVID vaccine, which is a viral vector vaccine, less effective. And we have the Novavax, which is, a, uh, like I mentioned earlier, a subunit vaccine. So we have four, but two mRNA one. Um, all right. So I mentioned earlier, and you might be wondering now, well, she said that this is an mRNA vaccine and the virus is not in there. Um, and people can't get the actual disease. So why do we get symptoms after the vaccine is administered? Well, first, not everyone gets any, not everyone gets symptoms, right? And um, redness and, and a little bit of pain or discomfort in the area where the vaccine was injected is pretty common. It doesn't matter what you're getting, right? It doesn't have to be a vaccine, any injection. After the injection, it hurts and it becomes red for a little while. So that, taking that aside, if, if that were not a symptom, a lot of people don't get any symptoms. Um, some people do get symptoms, but it's actually quite simple to explain, right? The immune cells target the antigens. That happens whether we're actually fighting the real thing or whether we're fighting the fake thing. In this case, the spikes that we're creating, that the spike protein. In the process of our immune system reacting to a, a, a foreign something, regardless of the type of vaccine as administered, it creates an inflammatory response that might lead to fever, headaches, achiness, and all these other general symptoms that some people might experience. The level of the symptoms or the length of the symptoms, which is usually no more than 24 to 48 hours, um, will depend on, on, I don't know, the health of the individual and, and other factors. So it varies by individual. Like I said, some people don't get any symptoms. Some get a mild headache that lasts an hour. Sometimes you get a little fever or you get a little achiness to your body, kind of flu-like symptoms. That is because your body is fighting. You're creating an immune response no matter what. You don't have anything. You're not sick. But your body's responding to this foreign thing that you just injected, and it it creates this inflammatory response that has these symptoms no matter what. Um, what else? So I briefly mentioned earlier, and, and you probably already know if you were vaccinated, these vaccines require two doses. They're about a, a month apart. One is 20 one day and the other one's 28, maybe, something like that. 20 something days, almost a month. 21 and 28. Yeah, there we go. Um, the first, the reason for this, the first dose is essentially to prime your immune system. It is it is a new, it's an introduction to this, this new thing in your body. Um, and we need to give it some time so that we can learn to make it and, and process it, right? The second dose Because you have asthma, you have COVID. Hmm. As a consequence of your asthma, or you have COVID, or you have asthma as a consequence of your COVID. You you can answer it. I'm I, I'm I'm going to keep talking, but you can answer, and I'll go back to you. Um, what was I saying? So the first one gives us the introduction to, to this pathogen and, and, and we, we learn to identify it and, and to process it, right? The second one is to help boost the effect of the first one, um, to make sure our bodies develop the memory to identify that intruder and then and therefore enhance um, the immunity. So, I mean, it, it's just like anything, right? The more you see something, the more likely you're able to remember it. It's the same thing with vaccines. Um, more troops you have, the more likely you are to win the war. So we want to make sure that we can generate as many as antibodies as quickly as we can to um, to ensure proper battling or, or proper fighting of that antigen. So with the first dose, you get about 50% immunity. And then with the second one, that goes up to about 95%. Um, so then you might be wondering, well, if I have 95% immunity, why do I need booster shots? Well, booster shots are there to help with the weaning immunity, right? After a while, if you haven't seen the antigen, you start to kind of forget it. And if you've seen it, it's likely that you fought it already and are becoming tired. So you need some additional resources to be able to respond if that threat reappears. Um, and that's why we need boosters. Boosters uh, are also um, sometimes designed to target different variants of the pathogens. 
viruses mutate really quickly. Um, and while for the most part they, they remain similar, they eventually get smart and start changing their appearance, so to speak, to disguise themselves so that our immune system does not recognize them anymore. So you think about hat and some glasses, right? They're like, oh, well, I look a little different now. I'm going to go and see what happens. Uh, so we need to be able to modify our vaccines uh, to present our immune system with the new face of the virus to properly identify and fight it. So that's why we need boosters. And sometimes the mutations to these viruses are so significant. Think about plastic surgery. So, okay, the hats and the glasses, now they recognize me with that. I'm going to have to do something more drastic. So what they do is they mutate so much um, that the body is simply unable to recognize that new form or variant of the virus. And we need updated vaccines to be able to fight them. And that's what happened with the Omicron um, sub-variant of the COVID virus. The original vaccine um, was designed to target the original SARS-CoV virus. And it simply did not recognize any variants. We did not know it was going to mutate as fast as it did. So at that time, a, um, a bivalent vaccine was created. Bivalent means that it had two components in one vaccine. It, B or by, it means two, right? So we wanted to be able to target the original version of the virus as well as the new one. That vaccine now is, is no longer um, available. Spivax is the, is the Moderna one. Yeah. So, yeah. So that vaccine is no longer available. And the reason it's no longer available is because we we no longer had that, that uh, virus. The original virus is no longer what the virus looks like. It's still a SARS-CoV virus, but it has mutated so much that it looks completely different. So we need to we needed to develop a new updated COVID vaccine. And this was recently released. Um, and it was designed to target the XBB subvariants of the uh, the Omicron XBB subvariants of the virus. Um, and it has also some studies have been done and it's also demonstrated efficiency with the newest and upcoming subvariants, which are the EG, um, the FL, and the uh, BA. Uh, so those are the ones that are on the rise, according to the most recent data. I pulled this out of the website, actually, uh, from the CDC site uh, three weeks ago. So it might have changed a little bit. Um, this is this is pretty up to date. Um, so why why now do we call it an updated vaccine rather than a booster? Well, because boosters are there to boost our immunity or the immunity that we, that we developed from a previous vaccine, right? And that's no longer the case. We, we, if we were to give a booster, we would be boosting the immunity from the previous vaccine, which is no longer even needed, right? Because it's, muted, it's mutated so much that original SARS-CoV virus doesn't really, ex it's not a, I'm not going to say it doesn't exist, but it's not a, a as prevalent, so it's not as much of a threat anymore. Um, the other reason we don't call it a booster and we call it an updated vaccine is just pure nomenclature, right? The FBI is likely going to make this now um, an annual thing, just like the flu vaccine. Uh, so we don't want to call it a booster. It would just be a a vaccine. So every year, they're probably going to change the formulation, given how fast this um, virus is known to evolve. Um, again, just like the flu, you get a flu vaccine every year, and likely at the same time, we're just going to have a COVID vaccine every year to try to target the um, most recent subvariant or most recent form of the virus. And that's all I have. These are some additional resources, some of which, I mean, I there's some of the slide information that I got, not from any particular site, but perhaps the information is found in the combination of these sites. I just uh, have been hammered and peppered with information in mRNA vaccines for so long that I kind of have this, kind of know this by heart. Um, but you can find probably all of the information in, in a combination of these of these sites here, if you want additional resources. And um, that's it, that's all I have. Uh, if anyone has any questions, I'll be happy to answer them if, if I know the answer. And if not, I will 
very honestly tell you, I don't. You're very welcome, Kimberly. Oh, you have asthma and you had and you caught COVID. Oh no. Three months ago and you still have it? Are they giving you anything to, to treat that? Sure thing. That is a good question, uh, Catherine, and I do not know. I do not know the answer. I um, I don't know the answer. I honestly don't know. I, it's differences in the environment. Um, uh, differences. It could be differences in the environment. It could be differences in the response. Like if 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 a lot of people are vaccinated against a particular strain of the virus. Um, it knows that it needs to mutate. I mean, they're they're intelligent little creatures, right? Um, so if they know that the majority of the population will be able to recognize them, they're gonna try to mutate and make themselves um, useful again in in their world, right? In our world, it's a problem, but in their world, um, so so probably they mutate faster in regions where people have developed immunity towards them. But that's just one potential reason. I, I there, there could be a, a variety of factors as to why they mutate faster or differently. The, the variants are not necessarily the same either. Uh, well, I'm glad you're COVID free now. Did you just write it out or? That must have been hard if you have asthma. You're welcome, Catherine. Well, if there are no more questions, then uh, thank you again for attending. Um, and I hope you enjoy the rest of what we have, uh, or Melissa, I say we. Um, Melissa has planned for, for Chemistry Week. It seems, uh, looks, it looks like it's going to be a fun week. So I hope that you can um, attend the other activities and uh, presentations as, as well.